operating on about four hours of sleep. Have no idea what's going to happen this morning, so hey. Uh, but we're here together, right? <laughs> oh, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 23. Chapter 23, we've been looking at the places where the Bible says, but God. Something is going on, and then the Bible says, but God, and then what did God do? And so we're continuing on, I want to look at today, God delivered. God delivered. 1 Samuel 23, beginning of verse 1, says, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Kelah. And they robbed the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Kilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we come to Kilah against the armies of the Philistines? And then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Kilah, and, and I will deliver the Philistines into thy hand. So David and his men went down to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and, brought, and brought, brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. And it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Keilah that he came down with an ephod in his hand. And so the backstory here is this is when David is on the run. He has been chosen by God and anointed as the rightful king of Israel, of Judah. And Saul has not yet ended his reign, and he's chasing David. Remember all the events that happened with David. David was a young man, probably 18, between, between 16 and 19 years old when he fought Goliath. Um, we always picture him in Sunday school as a little bitty boy, but that's not how it was. And, and think about it, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I, that's the way I was always taught, that David was a little bitty boy. And, and if you remember the story, he comes to Saul to tell him he will go and fight. And Saul gives him his armor to, to put on. If David wasn't basically a grown man, if he's a 10-year-old boy like we keep picturing in our Sunday school literature, why would Saul, who is head and shoulders taller than anybody in the country, why would he give him his armor? Can you imagine putting the armor of a, of a large man on a boy to try? And so David tried it, obviously, but he said, I haven't proved this. I haven't worked with this, so I'm just going to go with what I know. And, you know, he goes down, he finds the five swimming stones, he goes and kills Goliath, and, and the songs begin to sing about his great, his great victory, and that, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands, and Saul becomes, you know, very wicked at that point, begins to try to chase David down and hunt him down. And so David is still on the run, he's got about 600 men with him, and so they're, they're out, and word comes to him that the Philistines have taken one of the places in Judah, and and he goes to the Lord, do we need to go do this? And the Lord tells him, yeah, go down. His men are concerned. They're, they're sought after in Judah, and they're worried about going down to Judah and to go fight this battle because they're, they're sought after. In a, but they go, and they, and they have a great victory. And so now we come to verse 7, and, it, and, he, and it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah, and Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar, the priest, bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? And Saul came down, and thy servant hath heard. Or, or uh, Saul came down, as thy servant hath heard. O Lord of Israel, Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Then David and his men, which were about six hundred, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever 
they could go. And it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, and he forbear to go forth. He didn't go forward. Father, you know the day. You know that all this going on. Father, you know my own mind and the, the struggles I'm having with my body and, and all the things that are happening. And we need you. I need you, Father, more today than, than, than ever in my life. Oh, Father, this has been a struggle, and you know what you need me to say here. And so, Father, I just pray that you'd help me clear my mind and, and touch me from inside and do the things that only you can do. Father, we do lift up those that we have so many that are ill and struggling, and we pray for your hand in their life, for your healing, and for your grace as they endure these times. Father, we, we ask for your control in this day, and, and we surrender to it. I surrender to you, Father. Just use me as you desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So <clears throat> David got wind that Saul was coming down, and he asked the Lord, is Saul actually coming as I've heard? And the Lord says, yes. He said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men to Saul? In other words, will they, will they lock stuff up and deliver us into the hand of Saul? And the Lord says, yes, they sure will. So they take off wherever they can go. They, they kind of sprawl out and go to different places for protection. And Saul finds out about it, but he doesn't, he doesn't decide to go on. He, he pauses. And in verse 14, it says, And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him out of his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. Now, if you go on and read the rest, you'll find this is, this is just before Saul is pursuing him, and he pursues him, and David is hiding out with several of his men in a cave, and Saul goes into the cave to cover his feet, which is a, a wonderfully polite way of saying that Saul had to go to the little boy's room. And so Saul is in there, he's doing his business, and David, his men say, David says, look, he's delivered him into our hands. And his men said, let's go kill him. And David stops, and he says, I cannot lay my hand against the Lord's anointed. Who am I to go against this man who God anointed king? He's the king of Israel, and I cannot do that. So he goes in and he cuts the cuts a section out of his robes, takes a piece of his garment. And when Saul finishes and he returns to his men, David steps out and, call, and, and actually goes up close to him and he bows before him and he said, you know, he says, you are the king, I am your servant, why are you chasing me? Why are you after me? What have I done? The Lord be a witness between you and me if I am guilty this day. Behold, you are in my hand. And he holds up the garment to show him that he was close enough to kill him, but he did not because he is the Lord's anointed. He said, why are you doing coming after me? I'm just a flea. I'm just nothing. And you're coming after me. What did I do? What did I do to justify this? And in that moment, Saul calls out and said, are you my son David? Now, he wasn't his son, correct? He's the son of Jesse. But Saul loved David, and David used to play the harp in his, in his home, in his, in his palace, and when the evil spirit would come on Saul, and David would play godly music, and it would drive the spirit away. Saul had an affinity for David, but he also had a pride issue, and he had a problem obeying God completely, and then because he didn't obey God, God removed the kingdom from him. He told him, the kingdom is done for you, boy. I'm giving it to a man after my own heart. So Saul is fighting this turmoil of that he loves David at the same time he hates David because Saul has destroyed his own, his own rule, but David is the, is the focal point of all that anger and frustration of his disobedience. And so here he, he has a softening, and he says, you're more righteous than I, and he turns him loose. A short time later, they're going to be in the forest. Saul is going to encamp around the area. They're going to slip in. David and many of his men are going to slip in. God's going to put them all into a deep sleep. And he's going to find Saul in the middle of the entire army, in a ditch, surrounded by all of his people, and Abiathar there to, to protect him with his spear in the ground at his head. 
and 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 I forgot what was on. The, he had something hanging on the spear, and so they take the spear. And, and I think it was a bag. But they take the spear, whatever it was, and, I, I, and it wouldn't be so bad, but I just read it again this morning, and I can't think of what it was. But anyway, so they take the spear, and so he calls out from a distance. He says, he calls out to his guard. He says, you've done a poor job. You are here to protect the king, the Lord's anointed, and you haven't done your job. You allowed somebody to come in to kill him. He said, behold, his spear. Saul recognizes his voice, and he calls out, and they chit-chat. You my son, David? He said, yes. The Lord's judge between me and thee. I'm just a flea that you're after. And I have done righteousness, and I have not laid my hand against you. And he tells the guard, he says, send somebody up here to take the spear. And he comes up and gets it, and again, David goes away. All through all of this, Saul is hunting him down. People have come to Saul and told him where David was. Saul has gone to where he's heard rumors that David was. He's pursued him from place to place to place. David is the rightful king of Israel, but because he will not lift a hand against the Lord's anointing, because he honors God and honors the king that God appointed, he's not sitting on the throne as he should be as the rightful king. But he's honoring God. And turn after turn after turn, Saul is in reach. And here we see one of, the, one of the great but God statements there in verse 14. But God delivered him not into his hand. You know, about 424 times the words God and deliver show up in Scripture. God delivers his people. Peter, talking about Lot, made the statement that God knows how to deliver the righteous out of the wicked. There's a place where it talks about where God knows how to preserve the wicked unto judgment. God delivers. No matter what we're going through, God is going to deliver. Now, we get in our mind, that means that nothing bad will ever happen to us. David is living in caves and in the forest as the king of Israel. Yet God is still delivering, isn't he? God has delivered him from the hand of the enemy. God has delivered David in other ways. You read past here a few chapters and you see the day that Nabal is slaughtering sheep and David sends men to go get some of the sheep because David and his men have protected Nabal from the Philistines and from several others coming in. And, and Nabal, the Bible says, is a churlish man. He's a foolish man. And he said, I don't know who you are. A lot of people come out and say they belong to whoever. Why should I give the food to my, to my workers, to you, to somebody I don't know? And they go back and tell David. And David said, everybody get your sword on. We're getting ready to take a trip. And David has sacrificed, has risked his life to protect Israel, including Nabal the churlish. And so David is on his way. They're girded up. But a servant saw all that happened and went in and told Abigail. Nabal's wife. David's about to come and destroy Nabal and everything he has because he is a mouthy guy. He does not know how to speak to anybody. And Abigail takes five of the lambs that have been slaughtered. She prepares them, and, and I think it was like 100 loaves or 200 loaves of bread. How many of y'all have 100 to 200 loaves of bread hanging around your house? <laughs> so she takes all this, and she, she gives them to the servant. She said, you go ahead of me with the food. I'm right behind you. And they go to where David is, and she comes up and she says, don't let this man drive you to do something you shouldn't do, David. He's a foolish man. He is the son of Belial. Don't let him cause you to sin. Here's food, here's everything that you sought after. And David recognizes that she's a godly woman and takes her advice and preserves them, and he goes on about his way. Later, she, when, when the, 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 the sacrifice, all, the, uh, I mean, all the, the skinning and everything is done, all the butchering is done, and, and the party is over the next day when the wine was gone, the Bible says, she tells Nabal what happened, and it 
it startles him so deeply that he starts having some heart issues. He starts being troubled inside. His heart fainted, I think is how the Bible put it. And then, and then a little while later, he dies. David has been delivered again. It doesn't say it that way. It doesn't say that God delivered him from doing something. But God's provision in David's life, delivering him from going down and slaughtering a fool... Abigail comes out, and through Abigail, God delivers David from doing something that would not have been good. David would have been right as far as the customs and the culture of the day. But it would have been wrong for him to go slaughter these people. And God used Abigail. Now listen, it's important that we understand God uses women. We forget how useful women are because we, we understand that within the church, that within a congregational setting, women cannot teach men. They can't hold authority over men. But that's in the congregation. Read Scripture. When Paul is talking about this, he's talking about when you come together, we're good. We got word, faith is okay. When we come together, when Paul is teaching about the spiritual gifts, he says, when you come together, so when we are congregated together as a church, there are certain rules that we have to abide by. Women in that day, they couldn't speak in tongues. They can't judge those who preach. That's still true today. They can't teach. They can't hold leadership over men. In the congregation, outside of this setting, there's no stress, there's no regulation there. Jesus had many women in his ministry. It, we get in the mindset, all they did was cook for him. I think there was a lot more involvement than that. Paul, you read his letters. As he closes his letters, he talks about all the people that, that salute you from wherever he's at. And many of those lists contain women. Women are useful. Women are valuable in the kingdom. And God uses women. And I know we got a mindset. I mean, we got the mindset that women can't talk in church because the Bible says, let your women keep silent in the church. That's only talking about speaking in tongues or judging preachers and only in the congregation. But that has limited us to understanding the value and the wisdom that God has blessed women with and their ability to see things differently than we do. Listen, we, we talk about women's intuition and we talk about things like that. So let me just give you a quick anatomy lesson. Women and men, whether you realize it or not, are different. Say it and so. But there's more than just the outward physical manifestations that we see as being different. Somewhere during the gestation process of little boys, there's a hormone bath that's released by mama. And it breaks down the, the corpus callosum, the, the tie between the left and right hemisphere, breaks it down, makes it much smaller. So men are either left-brained or right-brained, but they're never both sides at the same time. We're brain damaged. It's your fault, women. If it weren't for the hormone bath you release, we wouldn't be this way. Actually, you want us to be this way because we think different. Guys, that doesn't happen with these ladies. They think with both sides of their brain all the time. They can't separate them. So while even women have a dominant left or right brain that, that they tend to be either more logical or strategical or they tend to be more right brain, more artistic or spatial, things like that, all of us have a leaning. But in, at all times, women are tied in both sides of the brain, which means their emotions are tied with their logic and everything else. This is why they're different than we are, guys. This is why we're never going to understand them. We don't think the same way. We don't talk the same way. You get a group of men together to talk about one subject until it's exhausted. And then they go to the next subject if there's time. You put five women together, they will talk about 22 different things. They'll talk about all 22 at the same time. And they will make statements randomly on all of the topics. And everyone in the group knows exactly what they're talking about. Say again? In two minutes. Angie and I will travel and we'll be talking. And I've learned some of this. I'm getting better at being able to keep up with the transitions. But every now and then we'll be driving and Angie will make a statement. 
And I'm racking my brain trying to figure out what she's talking about. We were just talking about such and such, and that, that doesn't fit anything. I, I don't know what we're talking about. So I am, I, she can smell the smell of the, you know, the wood burning. And, and I, I'm, I'm racking my brain trying to figure out what does that apply to us. And she will graciously say, we're talking about this now. Okay, I'm good. She's figured out I can't keep up because I can't talk about that many things at the same time and keep up with what the statements are. We are different. We talk about women's intuition. Really what that is is because women think with both sides of their brain constantly, they pick up on things that we don't pick up on. They will see subtleties in people that we will never see unless we're trained to watch for things. Somebody twitches, their eye twitches, their nose twitches too much, or they flare their nostrils too much. Women see that stuff, and they may not register in the front of their mind that this is what's going on. But, but I, I learned a long time ago, Angie and I will meet people, and we'll, we'll meet somebody, and we'll get through time, we go, and I'll say, man, wasn't, wasn't he great? Wasn't, you know, he's just such a, a neat guy. And Angie will go, I don't know. Something touched her, bothered her. I learned years ago, she's right. I haven't seen her miss yet. So when we meet somebody for the first time, we walk away. If my wife goes, I don't know, there's something there, my little antenna go up. And I start waiting to see. And she comes out right every time because she sees stuff I don't see. She picks up on things I don't pick up on. I think God uses that in every aspect of a woman's life. And I believe the women that were part of Jesus' ministry were sharing their special gift of being a woman and seeing things. And being able to translate that. And even though Jesus was so tuned in to the Holy Spirit and did not need anything like that, I am sure that his apostles were being cued in from subtleties from women like Mary and Martha and the other women that were with them. I don't think they were just there to cook and clean. I think they were there to minister. And I believe God used the nurturing and the compassion and that ability for a woman to see things that men never do, never will, because we don't think the same way. I believe God used that in their lives to help them. Just like he took Abigail, a godly woman, and sent her out to David so David would have a little less blood on his hands. If you look at what Abigail says and you read that, it was a teaching to a king. It was done with respect. It was done in yielding to him as the king and as a man, but it was still teaching nonetheless. Outside of this group, I don't know how limited women are. Can't find it in the scripture. There's some things reserved to males, just like there are things reserved to females. And we need to grow up and understand God loves us. And he holds us as valuable in his sight, male and female. And God honors male and female when they serve him and follow him and honor him. And we remember that especially today when we're diminishing women so terribly with all this multi-gendered, skewed gender garbage. We're destroying women. And somebody needs to stand up and speak. And by the way, as children of God, we're the ones who are supposed to be speaking. God delivered David, not just from enemies, but from himself. God delivers us. And sometimes we look at some of the things in the Bible and we go, but God didn't deliver. Yes, he does. Stephen is preaching. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. The last time you see those words in Scripture, by the way, in the, in the narrative, is Stephen giving the last presentation of the kingdom to the Jew. And they get ticked. They run up on him and they chew on him and they yell at him and they start stoning him. Hey, well, that's not much of deliverance. Do you read the last things that... Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God to receive me. And then he prays, Father, lay not this charge to their account. And he gave up the ghost. He was delivered. Folks, the Bible says, 
that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have, present tense, everlasting life. Folks, I don't know if you know this. I've preached this and I've taught this and I've said this and I'm going to keep saying it and, and, until the Lord calls me home. But listen, that have, present tense, everlasting life, shall not perish in having everlasting life. We are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. We have eternal life. But we have something else. We're not going to die. This body will quit. This physical body will die, but we won't be in it. We have Bible proof. We have evidence. We have God's promise. We have pictures. We have events. Remember, this is not a storybook. This is not a storybook. And in somewhere, we've got to get parents convinced that when we teach the Bible, we cannot teach it like storybooks. We have done so much damage to people being able to understand and take this book for what it says because we raise our kids on all the stories. Let's read a story today. Let's read about Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf. Let's read about Moses and the bulrushes. Let's, let's read about Little Miss Muffet. And let's do Little David and the Giant. And so we teach our kids, these are all just stories, these are all just stories, these are all just stories. Folks, this is not a storybook of fiction. This is a history book of reality. The things that take place in this book, they really happened. And every time an archaeologist turns a shovel over, he buries another liberal. Oh, well, nobody had laws before such and such, and we found the laws of Hammurabi. Oh, wait a minute, they were writing laws, you know, a couple of thousand years before they thought we were. Hmm. God just keeps proving that what he said is real. God said, if we trust him, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we will not die. The beauty of Psalm 23 is it explains to us that we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say we walk through the valley of death. We don't walk into death. It says we walk in the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. And even if it do, there's nothing to be scared of. And I know so many preachers, and I love them dearly, but they teach that death for a saint is just like closing your eyes. You just close your eyes in this life and you open them up the next. If that's true, then God lied. He said we don't die. Stephen is a perfect example. Stephen is being stoned, and suddenly Stephen's unaware of the stoning as far as the pain and what's going on with his body because the heavens are opened. And he's seeing Jesus standing to receive him. And he leaves before his body has a chance to die. Before he can endure the torture of, of all that's going on, God preserves him. My grandmother, my great-grandmother had cancer, colon cancer, and it got into her bones. And, and I think I've told this story, and if I have, just bear with me. I'm, I'm getting to be the old guy that can't remember what stories he's told and what ones he hasn't. My great-grandmother couldn't turn. You couldn't put a diaper on her without something breaking. It was excruciatingly painful. And, and she just couldn't. Uh, there was just nothing left of her portal, frail body. But early in the morning, like 2, 3 in the morning, Aunt Betty, who had lived with her, heard her singing. And when she goes into her bedroom, my great-grandmother, who hasn't moved in months because of the fractures, is sitting on the end of the bed, swinging her legs, and, when, and singing. And when my Aunt Betty comes in, she says, Oh, get my bags, honey, they're coming for me. Hurry, they're almost here, they're coming for me. And she didn't know what to do. She, she darts off into the room. She grabs the phone. She calls the, the after-hours doctor number, leaves, you know, telling me you know, what's going on. And when she walks back... My grandmother's gone. What happened? My grandmother saw the heavens open. I was holding the foot. I was rubbing the foot of my granny Mac. My dad was holding her right hand. My uncle Jimmy holding her left hand. And I was there rubbing her feet when she passed away. And I'm here to tell you, we're just looking, no words are being spoken at this point. We're just sitting there. She had, had communicated with my dad for some time with her one eye. She lost one to cancer. She'd been communicating with my dad with no words. 
And Uncle Jimmy came in. She lay back and held her hand up. And Uncle Jimmy grabbed her hand and looked at that one little eye. And, and they were communicating. Don't know what they were saying, but they was communicating. And all of a sudden, the light went away. You could feel her spirit leave the room. You could feel the presence of God. And it was just like that. And she was gone. And it was so startling. Jimmy shuddered and he looked up at my dad. And he said, Bobby, she's gone. He said, yeah, I know. That was wild. Her monitor's still going. She's still got a regular heartbeat. But Granny was gone. And it was obvious Granny was gone. And we sat there and talked about that for probably five minutes before her heart rate started slowing, slowing, and slowing until finally it was just a systole, just a straight line. And, and the nurse came in and said, you know, she's gone. And, and one of the two said, a little while ago. Listen, we don't die. There's no, okay, this life and open them up into the next life. Folks, when it's our time, the heavens open and we see Jesus. And we simply go from here to there. Harold Wilmington calls it the happy hop from here to hallelujah. We just leave this place. We go to meet God. Then this sinful body experiences the fullness of death. But we do not. We are delivered. We are delivered from death unto righteousness. And that deliverance, that salvation, is a permanent deliverance that we will experience in full the day we leave this earth. Whether that is we hear the trumpet and we are caught up, or for whatever reason, this body is done and God calls us home before the rapture of the church. Either way, we will simply see the heavens open and see Jesus Christ and we'll leave. And then whatever happens to the body is going to happen. Folks, God delivers. He always delivers. We have people that we beg God to heal. And sometimes their illness is unto death. And Paul says, where's the sting? Where's the victory of the grave? It's swallowed up in Christ. It's swallowed up in life. Death is just simply a vehicle for us to go home. It's like the story of the guy who has the son who's allergic to bees and a bee gets in a car. And dad grabs that bee, and then he turns him loose. And the son starts screaming, no, no, dad, I'm allergic. He says, don't worry about it. He holds up his hand and says, the stinger's gone. Nothing for you to worry about. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he took the sting out of death. Death for us is nothing. It's just the time we get to go home. And the physical death we never experience anyway. We get to the shadow. We can see it. We can see it's coming. When my dad had his first heart attack, I was a little boy. I was scared to death. I was sitting in the room, and I just started crying. Dad said, what's wrong? I said, I'm scared that you're going to die. He said, I'm not going to die. He said, I said, Daddy, how do you know that? He said, because the Bible promised me dying grace, and I'm scared too. So I'm not dying. He was right. Not then anyway. You see, God promised us grace. God promised his presence. God promises deliverance. We will be delivered from this sin. We'll be delivered from this body, from this sin nature. We'll be delivered from the presence of sin when he takes us home one day. We will be delivered from all our illnesses. It may not happen in this life. I have prayed for God to heal me of the MS. This occurred, I was diagnosed while I was still at Roland Row when I was with Faith Bible Institute. And the church came down and prayed. And God has not chosen to heal me yet. But I will be healed. It may not occur in this life, but I will be healed because there is no sin and no corruption in heaven. And where God is, sin cannot exist. And all illness is from sin. And listen, sometimes we, we have an illness because of personal sin. It's God's way of getting our attention. But illnesses in this world 
because of sin. Without sin, there's no illness. There's no corruption. And that can't follow us to heaven. So no matter how I leave this life, as Brother Adrian used to say, whether the cloud route or the cloud route, either way, when I make that transition, when I see Jesus face to face, I will have no illness of any kind. I will be whole. I will be delivered from the effects of this sin. I'll be delivered from sin. I will once and for all never experience sin and its effect ever again. And the same is true for every person who has trusted Christ as their Savior. If you have come to the place where you recognize that you are a sinner, you say, I am a sinner, I know Jesus died for me, and you put your trust in Jesus, I trust you, I ask you to forgive me my sins. Whatever words you use, whatever terms you use there, as long as you're getting to that point that you're acknowledging you're a sinner, Jesus is the Savior, and you trust Him and Him alone for your salvation. That is salvation. And the instant you trust, salvation takes place. And the sealing of the Holy Spirit occurs, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit occurs, and the ability to miss heaven goes away. No way to miss heaven from that point on. Can you live like a boogerhead? Yes, you can. Is salvation a license for us to go ahead and live like a boogerhead? No, it is not. And God is a loving God, and like a parent, He will whip His children. And his ability to spank us is so much more efficient than any parent we've ever had. So it's not a license to sin. In fact, you get this big dose of conviction and, and punishment when we try to live in sin. God has our number, our address. He knows how to fix it if we don't want to listen. But folks, the moment we trust Christ as our Savior, it's a done deal. Death is no longer a part of our existence. We are delivered. But God delivers. We may endure some difficult times, but God will deliver. One way or the other, God always delivers. Question is, are we willing to trust and wait for that deliverance. Notice in the days, David prays. Sometimes a couple of times as we saw. Almost like a, God, is this going to happen? Yes. Um, <clears throat> just, just one more time, Father. Just a quick question. Is this going to happen? <laughs> yes. But God delivers and david relies on that deliverance time and time again and he writes about that deliverance there's multiple times through the psalms that you read david talking about god delivering him from his enemies delivering him from this struggle delivering him from this battle god delivers he's the same god today as when david was walking this earth and god still delivers he still delivers his people it may not happen in our time frame. It may not happen the way we think it's supposed to happen. But I promise you, according to the Word of God, God delivers. Are you struggling this morning? God delivers. Go to Him. Talk to Him. Trust Him. God delivers. Are you here this morning or listening? And you never trusted Christ as your Savior. I tell you, God delivers. He delivers us through, from our sins through Jesus Christ, His only Son, sacrificed on Calvary for our sin debt. If we trust Him, God says, that's enough for me. Have you been delivered from the penalty of sin by trusting Christ? If not, Jesus saved me. I'm a sinner. So easy. If you mean it, God does business. Children of God, are we resting in the deliverance of God? Because God delivers. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for showing us so many times through your word how you deliver us from sin, from enemies, from illness, from, from everything in our life. You deliver us. Thank you for being a delivering God. Thank you for being the opposite of all of our life. But 
God. What precious words, Father, but God. No matter what we're going through, but God. It may be fantastic. We may be, we may be praising and celebrating on what's going on, but, but God, you're responsible. It, it may be horrible. It may be terrible what we're experiencing, but God, you're there to deliver. You're there to comfort. You're there to guide. You're there to heal. You're there to strengthen and train through the difficulties. You're always there no matter what it is. We can know no matter what's happening somewhere in our scenario, in our difficulty, in our whatever we're going through, somewhere in there is but God. Help us to trust that, to enjoy that, to look for these kinds of things so we can have the peace and the joy that you promised us so we can, we can find new ways to experience you, to see you working in our lives. But God delivered. Thank you, Father. Whatever our need is this morning, you know our hearts. We can't know them. We can't even know our own heart, Father. You said the heart is, is desperately wicked. It's deceitful. You're the only one who can know it. So search our hearts, Father. Purge us this morning. Show us the sins that we have not confessed so we can be right with you. That nothing stand between you and us. Clear the minds of those who have not yet trusted your Son as their Savior. Let them see and hear clearly that you sent your Son, not for a religious cause, but to pay a price that was due for our sin. That in his sacrifice, burial, and resurrection, you paid that price, and all we have to do is accept it. Trust Him that He is our payment. And we can experience the fullness of Your salvation. Father, whatever our need is this morning, touch us. Give us the courage to step out. If we need to come down here and pray, if we need to come and talk about salvation, come to receive You and make that a public, public thing. We need to come and pray, get some things right, whatever it is, Father. Give us the strength to do that. Block our pride. Let us just obey You this morning. Whatever you need us to do, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.